I came to you with my heart in pieces and found a God with healing in his hands. I turn to you, put everything behind me and found the God who makes all things new. I look to you, drowning in my questions and found the God who holds all wisdom. And I trusted you and stepped out on the ocean. You caught my hand among the waves, cause you're the God of all my days. Each step I take, you make a way, and I will give. from you, haunted by my failures, and found the God whose grace still covers me. I fell on you when I was at my weakest, and found the God, the lifter of my head. And I worship you and felt you right beside me you're the reason that i sing because you're the god of all my days he step i take you make a way and i will trying to say there. 
The Bible, of course, is the foundational document of the Christian faith, and it's my goal uh, through this series to encourage you to love and trust Scripture the same way that I love and trust Scripture. But uh, let's be real. (laughs) It's quite a challenge. This is quite a challenge. Uh, The Bible has a lot to say about good and bad. It has a lot to say about things we should do and things we shouldn't do. And here's a little secret uh, about people, in case you didn't know. Um, They don't like being told what to do. Uh, So the Bible, uh, it owes its existence to this wonderful human characteristic. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they didn't like being told what to do, and so they deliberately disobeyed God. God was like, I made this perfect garden for you, and you can eat of the trees all throughout the garden except for one tree. And where did they go to eat? They went to the one tree that God told them not to eat from. I was really impressed by my son this week. He uh, cleaned his room without being told to clean his room. And I I thanked him for that. (laughs) And uh, I I was like, you cleaned your room? And he said, well, yeah, I like doing chores. I was like, wait, what? (laughs) You like doing chores? And he said, yeah, I love doing chores. I just don't like it when you tell me to do them. It's a human characteristic that I thought was very rude and obnoxious. And then I went to Walmart, and I was in the self-checkout aisle. And I was next in line waiting for one of the little... Uh, registers to open up, and I wasn't paying good attention. I was looking around the store. I get distracted easily, and one of the registers just had cleared out, and I didn't notice, but the, the lovely gentleman behind me bumped me with his cart and said, hey, you can go now. He's right. I'm wrong, but I'm furious. Why? Because I don't like being told what to do. See, the Bible is a story that will teach us, and in order to teach us, it's going to rebuke us, It's going to correct us, and it's going to train us to help us become the ideal examples of what a human has the potential to be. But unfortunately for a lot of us, we are going to miss out on our potential because we do not like being told what to do. So if you don't set under the authority of Scripture, if you don't allow the Scripture to form you, then you're going to be living out of step with reality. That's why a lot of Christians have really terrible views on the sanctity of human life, on sexuality, on gender, on politics. It's why a lot of Christians are confused about the origin of life and the meaning of life. See, my phone here, it can do a a lot of really cool things, Um, but one thing my phone cannot do is make toast. Phone can't make toast. So imagine this, what if I was like, hey phone, You can do all this cool stuff, but you can't make toast. Then imagine if my phone got mad at me for saying that and decided to dedicate all of its time to making toast. Won't be able to do it. It's going to hurt me. It's going to hurt the phone. It's going to hurt my mom because she won't be able to text me 100 times a day. Sorry, I had to get that off my chest. But uh, So yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable when we are being told what to do. But it's important to let the Bible story form us because when we submit to the scripture, we live in step with reality. And when you live in step with reality, then you are taught a new way, and dare I say, a better way to be human. So we struggle with reading the Bible because we don't like being told what to do. We also struggle with reading the Bible because we're just not patient people. John Mark Comer last week gave us a definition of scripture. He said, the Bible is a library of writings that are both divine and human, that together tell a unified story that leads us to Jesus. But I think he left out a a part of this definition that's really important. See, when we're being formed into the image of Jesus, it happens over a period of time. And so when you approach the Bible, you need to approach the Bible as if it's great art, As if it's a classic album, like maybe Radiohead's OK Computer, or the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds, or Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, or perhaps Nirvana's Nevermind, or the Beatles' Abbey Road. You need to approach the Bible as if it's great art, like a great movie, like Casablanca, or The Godfather, Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the movie. Okay, maybe that's not a masterpiece, but it's one that I happen to like. You need to approach the Bible as if it's great art, like, 
like paintings, like Salvador Dali, The Persistence of Memory, or Van Gogh's Starry Night, or Michelangelo, not the turtle, but Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. See, these, these masterpieces, they all have two things in common. Great art forces you to ask serious questions. Great art forces you to ask serious questions. They have, it has a meaning and a, a substance that goes miles below the surface. And it causes us to ask questions about the perspective of the artist and what the art is trying to communicate. Clay Christensen, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, he says, questions are places in your mind where answers fit. If you haven't asked the question, then the answer has nowhere to go. So the Bible is written with intentional ambiguity. It's written with intentional ambiguity. What that means is when you read the Bible, there are going to be concepts. There are going to be concepts and, and thoughts that just they slip through your fingers. First time you read it, second time you read it, third time you read it, fourth time you read it, fifth time you read it. You could read these passages multiple times, and there's going to be parts of the passage, concepts that are just going to slip through your fingers, and that's okay, because the Bible was designed to cause you to ask questions, because when you ask a question, then you create a place in your mind for an answer to fit. Great art encourages questioning. It also encourages repeat engagements. So, all great works of art are meant to be experienced over a period of time. If you see a great piece of art, you look at it one time, and you have no desire to see it again, you have no, uh, no longing to peel back the layers, you have no need to re-engage with the work of art, then friends, it's not great art. See, there's a reason that people continue to travel to art galleries all over the world to see Van Gogh paintings. There's a reason that the Beatles' Abbey Road album is always in the top of the Apple Music charts, even decades after its release. There's a reason that television channels pay top dollar to rerun Gone with the Wind for the umpteenth thousandth time, and it's because great art wants repeat engagements. Great art is like the Bible. It just doesn't give up its secrets very easily. You have to be patient with it. You have to spend time with it. You have to thoughtfully consider it. You have to ask questions of it. And you cannot get frustrated when you want to go fast and learn everything about the Bible, but the Bible is designed to go slow. So great art causes you to re-engage with it. So we get frustrated with the Bible because we don't like being told what to do. And a lot of us, were not very patient with the Bible. So what does the ideal Bible reader look like? Well, that's what we're told here in Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway of the sinners, or set in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but for the way of the wicked, it leads to ruin. So the ideal Bible reader is a person who meditates on the Lord's instruction. Uh, Lord's instruction is just a way of saying all of Scripture. So it, the ideal Bible reader is somebody that meditates on the whole of Scripture. It also teaches us that the ideal Bible reader is a person who meditates on the Bible day and night. So meditation, that's something in our culture when we think of, we often think of yoga. And yoga is the practice of emptying the mind. But the Bible defines meditation in a different way. The Bible defines meditation as filling your mind with profound truth. And it says that we should do this day and night. That's a, an ongoing consideration. That means you move backwards and forwards through Scripture on a regular basis to uncover all of the, the profound truths that are woven into each book of the library. So to sum that up, the, the ideal Bible reader is someone who fills their mind with profound truth on a regular basis. And friends, this disqualifies a lot of us from being the ideal Bible reader. I've told you before, my favorite day of the week is Sunday. Well, my favorite meal of the week is Sunday lunch because I eat it with my family. Sometimes we splurge and we go to Volcano. Sometimes we go to Taco Bell. Sometimes we go to Dairy Queen. But I just love eating that meal with my family. 
Favorite day, favorite meal. But I'm going to need some paschetti sometime during the week. That's what my daughter calls it. She's six, and it's very cute. I love when she says that. I'm going to need some chicken wings. I'm going to need some Hot Pockets. I'm going to need some mashed potatoes. I'm going to need some, some sustenance. <laughs> you going to scramble them for me, buddy? <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to need some, some food throughout the week. If not, I'm going to be hangry, right? So we need sustenance. We need food throughout the week. Sunday can be your favorite day. It could be your favorite meal, but you're going to need to eat throughout the week to be healthy. As a a Bible reader, we also need to read the Bible more than once a week. If today is the only day that you feast on Scripture, then you are going to be starving by Friday. And so we have to learn to, to read the Bible more than just on Sundays. Jesus knew this really well. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, he's being tempted by the devil, and he's hangry. Check this out. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. Yes, Jesus is 100% God, but he's also 100% human. And so Jesus was hungry. And it says, the tempter approached him. The devil came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And he answered, it is written... Where is it written? It's written in the Old Testament. It's written in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Jesus knew his Bible. Jesus knew scripture. Jesus knew where to go. And he says this to the devil. He says, man must not live on bread alone, but on, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus enjoyed life. He went to weddings. He went to festivals. He had friends, he had a life, and he enjoyed living it, but he did not let his life, the bread, overcome every part of his schedule. See, Jesus created a margin in his life for reading the scripture and for going to church. It says, as was his custom, going to church on Saturday, going to synagogue. Jesus had a custom of going to church, he had a custom of going off to pray, and he had a regular schedule of reading the Bible. So when the devil came calling, he knew exactly what to say. He was weak. He was vulnerable to temptation. He was hungry, and the devil was offering him a meal, yet Jesus did not take the bait because his mind was full of Scripture. The great work of art, this Bible, has been uniquely crafted to be read and reread over a lifetime. And every time you read it, it's going to give up a new dimension of wisdom. It's going to give up a, a new inspiration as you journey across its pages. And you'll be able to live the life that God has marked out for you, a life, according to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, of happiness. Anybody else want to be happy? Yeah, we, we all want happiness. Well, this is how we get it, Bible, because we aren't entertained by the Bible. See, some of you feel bad because reading the Bible for you is not as entertaining as the new Harry Potter book or the new season of Stranger Things is in the Lord's instruction. His delight is in the Lord's instruction. Delight is not synonymous with entertainment. Delight is... Not a simple word. I, I love word studies, but this one is pretty confusing for me because delight is defined as a, a deep affection for something that you won't fully understand. So I delight in looking at the stars. I delight in catching a fish. I delight in watching my daughter fly a kite. I don't understand why I can see the light from a star that's billions of miles away. I don't understand why there's so many species of fish in the rivers and the oceans. I don't understand how uh, the aerodynamics work against the invisible properties of, of wind. I don't understand any of those things, but I can tell you I delight in them. They're, they're not entertaining. They're delightful. So entertainment is a separate thing from delightfulness. So delightful experiences, they, they captivate your imagination. They cause you to maybe question life at a, a deeper level. So don't give up on the Bible just because it doesn't scratch that entertainment itch. 
Let it be what it is. It's a great work of art that over the course of your lifetime will help you discover and take new delight in Jesus, in God, in humanity, in the world around you. I've encouraged you to read the short passages of Scripture, which is something we're really good at. We do it every Sunday. I I preach on a short passage of Scripture. In small group Sunday schools, we talk about short passages of Scripture, youth group, CAs, children's church, women's Bible study. That's what we do. We, We look at little passages of Scripture. But the reason we do this in community is because one mind cannot contain the wealth of Scripture. It's a community endeavor. It's a group endeavor. It's, it's a community getting get together to ponder the deeper things of Scripture and to work these things out together. So we read the short passages, and, I've, and last week we talked about how we should read larger passages of Scripture. But today I want to talk about meditating on Scripture. In the second verse of Psalm chapter 1, it says that we should meditate on it day and night. There's this practice that dates back to the third century in the Christian church. It's called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina, it's not a a Bible study. It's not an annual reading plan. What it is, it's a way of meeting with God himself in the scriptures. So uh, the way it works, it's a five-step process. The way it works is the first thing you do is you read. And the only way to be able to read the Bible is you have to take your phone and you have to turn it off. Don't mute it, don't silence it, don't just flip it over, because I know you can still see the light coming out from under it every time you get a notification. These things actually have a power button on them, and you can turn them off. So take your phone and turn it off. And if you have kids, hide from your children. That's all I can say. I don't know any other thing to tell you. You got to get alone. You got to get into a, a quiet place where you can read the Bible. And then what you would do is you would read through your your favorite psalm. By the way, if you don't have a favorite psalm, just open the Bible right in the middle and start reading there. So read through your psalm and pay attention to what God is saying to you as you read, things that maybe stick out to you. And then part two is you reflect. Reflect on what you've just read. So you take a second and you think about what you just read and the things that stood out to you, and then you repeat it. Because remember, great art demands repeat viewings. And so you go back and you reread the psalm again. And as you read it this time, you're going to ask yourself, well, what does this mean to my life today? Then step four, you respond. You respond in prayer, but you also respond by uh, changing something in your life. So for me, it was, you know, I asked myself as I was reading through a psalm, I said, why was I so mad at the guy at Walmart for bumping me with his cart and telling me to go? It was my fault for not paying attention. So why am I so mad at him? That's what God was revealing to me as, as I was reading it. So as I reread the psalm for the second time, I realized that I need to practice patience. I need to make some changes in my life so that doesn't happen again. And that's what this style of reading will allow you to do. It gives you a chance to respond to the things that God is saying to you. And then lastly, you rest. We, we really, a lot of us struggle with this, but after you read, take two or three minutes and just sit there quietly, clear your mind, and allow God the opportunity through the Holy Spirit to speak. You say, well, <clears throat> why would I do that? <laughs> um, I have kids. They play 300 different sports. Uh, I got to get them to practice. I have uh, I've got to work from like 8 to 8 every day. I mean, i got so much going on. Why would I want to give up 20 minutes of my day to do this? Well, verse 3 of Psalm chapter 1 tells us exactly why we should do this. It says, He is like a tree planted beside the flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I want you to notice something about the Bible that I think a lot of Christians don't understand. Happiness and blessedness do not come from following a list of do's and don'ts. Happiness and blessedness do not come from following a list of do's and don'ts. A lot of people assume the Bible is just a list of do this, don't do this. That's not at all what the Bible says about itself. This isn't a reward for bringing your Bible to church. Blessedness is not a a reward for not cussing all week. Blessedness is not a reward for staying away from the liquor store this week. That's not what it is. Happiness, blessedness comes from a particular practice, and that practice is meditating on Scripture on a regular basis. 
It's filling your mind with profound truth on a regular basis. And when you do that, when you practice meditating on Scripture, it says that your soul will draw nourishment from the Word the same way this tree draws nourishment from the stream. I was reading an article about a missionary couple in China that got stranded over there after World War II for two years inside a communist regime that was very hateful toward them. Uh, they, they told them they weren't allowed to talk to anybody. They put them in this little tiny room to live. It was this couple and their, their young daughter. And all they had was enough money to have one cup of rice per day. And then Art Matthews would go out in the street and he would collect uh, animal refuse and he would fry it and they would live off of that as well. They had one stool and they had one stove and that was it for two years. Yet when they finally escaped they wrote a book called Green Leaf in a Drought Time. They took the title of the book right out of this passage of Scripture. And in the book, it said that they found delight. They found delight. I've been through some tough stuff in my life, nothing like what they went through. And I wasn't able to find delight. In this situation, they were able to find delight. And I'm like, how? How could you possibly delight in this situation? And they went on to explain that their delight came from the Word of God. They had a Bible, and they read the Bible together every single day. And they said that this Word of God became alive to them, and it gave them hope, and it gave them happiness. It even gave them nourishment. When they were hungry and they read the Bible, the Bible filled their stomachs. The Bible was everything that they needed, become a blessing to everyone. So when you meditate on Scripture, you become someone that doesn't just collect cool quotes and put them on Instagram or whatever. You become a Bible reader that enjoys the little stories and the big stories, that memorizes Scripture, that practices Lectio Divina, which is actually meeting with God in Scripture. And when you do that, it says that everything that that person does is going to prosper. You will prosper at school. You will prosper in your sport. You will prosper in your career. You will prosper in your ministry. You will prosper in your marriage. You will prosper raising your children. You will prosper, prosper raising your grandchildren. The Scripture says that if you meditate on it day and night, regularly, throughout the week that you will be truly happy. What an awesome promise. But the only way to obtain that promise is to meditate on the Word. So what I want you to do is come to the Psalms this week ready to delight and meditate, ready to meet with God, one reading at a time for one life.